The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here to deep dive into persona is tech founder in the speed of light environment of AI, must be exhausted constantly, is co-founder and CEO of Persona and based in beautiful Perth in Western Australia. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Charlie Westerman. Welcome. Hello. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Good to be here. Now, I believe you. We were just saying before we uh, hit record that you've you're probably maybe a bit jet lagged with all the travel you've been doing. You just came back from some sort of trade travel thing in the UK. Is that right? A uh, bit of a delegation to London. Oh my! Yes, yeah. We were there for the announcement of the new free trade ag- agreement between uh, the UK and Australia, including the free flow of data as well. Awesome. Um, and that was. Brilliant. It was so insightful and it directly affects businesses like ours Mm. handling Delta. Um, And it was just great to be there for the announcement. Fantastic. And I guess it's so easy to think that a lot of these things don't impact us. You know, you look at some of that stuff and you think, really? Like it's just a whole lot of people in suits going to talk a whole lot of other people in suits. Like, I mean, it's hard to connect with that stuff until businesses, you know, businesses like yours and others get to participate in that and they can really see the impact that those senior government officials or whoever, even conversing with people like yourself, the impact that can have on the future, you know, it can yeah. really change their minds or get them better understanding about things. Yeah, that's right. There were a lot of suits, <laughs> <laughs> but the actual negotiators for the agreement on the Aussie and British end uh, were in the room answering questions Lots of sort of very important individuals from the government, both sides yep. of the government. Um, and it was great to be in the moment asking questions and being able to get a better understanding as to how we can utilize this new trade agreement to our advantage. Absolutely. And and we just can't kid ourselves that we're on this lone island anymore, can we? Like we, we are part of a global community and we all sort of need to at the very least understand what that means. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And there's great UK incentives for Australian businesses wanting to make the UK their second home now as well. Exciting. Oh, all righty then. Maybe I need to think about that. Yes, you've got me cogitating now. (laughs) Maybe maybe they need a redheaded Aussie over there doing some financial advice. I'll, I'll update everybody later, folks. Well, before we dive into Persona, which I'm keen to get to, we'd love to take a moment to get to know you through your use of technology. So let's start with emojis. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do. I'm a part of a generation that uses the emojis quite actively. (laughs) As an actual language. Pretty much as an actual language, (laughs) yes. Whether it's reacting to just a message and not replying or actually using emojis. Um, I did take a look. My most used emoji is the hands, two hands up sort of sign like, yeah, hey. Nice. Um, Or the fire emoji as well. 
Awesome. All right. So lots of exciting things happening in your world, clearly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's right. All good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, we haven't had anybody, you know, answer oh, thumbs down. And I'm thinking that would, I feel like I'd need to pull them aside and have a quiet word. Like, is everything okay? You know? Yeah, you, you wouldn't want that. <laughs> you wouldn't, would you? You absolutely wouldn't. And how about smartphone, smartwatch, whatever your smart thing that is probably attached to you, like all like it is for all the rest of us, if you had to delete all the apps off it, which would be the three that you'd you'd keep? Yeah, you, you're going to be really surprised. I also took a look at just how many apps I've got on my phone. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm one of those guys that, you know, will upgrade their phone, but will just transfer all the data and just do that transfer yeah. from the old phone to the new phone. Me too. Uh, I had a look. I think I've got about 150 yeah. apps on my phone. Okay. And let's be honest, I probably use about four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I had to delete everything and keep three, um, I would definitely keep LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. I actually don't use social media that much yep. anymore. Yep. Um, I would keep an app called Lucid. And for the people that don't have time to read but still want to learn and keep their brain mm-hmm. quite active, Lucid is a great app that summarizes books into sort of bite-sized visual uh, sessions, if you want to call them that. Um, So there's Lucid. And I would probably keep Slack as well. Slack is one of my favorite apps. And talking about emojis, you can upload your own custom emoji gifts to Slack. And, uh, yeah, we've got – a fair few in our company. <laughs> we do too. And it, look, it's I think it's a massively underutilized thing in Slack. But when I discovered that feature fairly early on for us in the business, you know, I had to upload the, you know, the uh, change out for a thumbs up, which was BB-8 with the lighter coming out of BB-8. And I'm like, that's fantastic. So I did the same thing. I'm like, oh, custom emojis. This is awesome. And we've you, got lots of moving ones, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can go nuts with it. Correct. <laughs> if we're going to have to live in that thing, why not make it fun? You know? That's right. That's right. All right, let's dive into persona, shall we? So, high level, just so everybody gets a sense of where you guys play. And, and you know, I can't really use the expression advice tech because it is broader than that. Um, it's it's in the – it's even broader than fintech, I'd argue. Um, yeah, we, we- – we play in the regulatory technology oh, yeah, space, okay. so the reg tech, reg space. tech space. And so are there many doing things similar to you or is this a really sort of new part of reg tech, this sort of and, – and for everybody listening, that is this sort of identification, AML, you know, those sort of things. Uh, is there many plays in that space yet is it, or is it pretty sparse so far? Yeah, there's a few larger players okay. that perform identity verification yep. and there have been um, for the past – 10 years, let's say. I actually would go as far to say as identity verification has become quite archaic. Okay. Um, How identities get verified nowadays or still currently at the moment is um, you've got these databases, government and commercial databases. They're about 10, 20, maybe older, years old. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you input your driver's license number, name, date of birth into a form that gets checked with this decade old database. Right. It comes back with a, yep, yeah, that matches or no, it doesn't. And that's how identity is verified. It's super archaic oh and it opens up a world of fraud. Yes. Well, and mistaken identity, all sorts of things that, that can go with that, I'd imagine. In fact, I just saw, um, it wasn't a post on TikTok because I haven't, I've managed to not put myself on TikTok yet, but I think it was a TikTok shared on one of the other platforms. And a lady had, had of course it was in the US, but it's had, you know, police storm into her house because they'd identified her as, you know, this person with this date of birth or whatever, and they'd got one number wrong. And, yeah. you know, she had okay. all these SWAT and all these other people to send on her house with her and her little five-year-olds, you know, and it's like, guys, these are things we shouldn't be getting wrong. Like, you know, it's really important that this stuff is accurate. It's funny you say that. So essentially how Persona came about is um, that I think by the time I was 18, I'd had my identity stolen right. as well. Yeah. Um, didn't realize it until I went for my first car loan, was obviously declined. Yeah. Uh, and then later found out that whoever it was, still don't know to this day, uh, had put 60 fraudulent credit inquiries oh. on my file. Oh, Now the average is one or two a year. Yeah. Um, so when I went for my car loan and the bank was probably thinking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Um, this guy's desperate for credit right. or something. <laughs> yeah, so ended up engaging credit lawyers, spending about $13,000 with credit lawyers, trying to get those inquiries removed off yeah. of my file on so I could continue life. And uh, I think I've still got about 24 of those inquiries wow. left on my file today. And I think looking back on it, we leverage credit throughout our life to achieve those, I guess, milestones of your life, mm. your first car, your first home. And unfortunately, I won't be able to do that, not for a while yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, and that's how sort of persona came about is because we really just want to protect identity and prevent fraud at the source, which is businesses or small businesses um, verifying that identity and processing those uh, transactions. So it sounds like you were coming at it, in fact, from the individual's perspective. So does that mean you started really on the more digital wallet space? Was that sort of where it started and then it evolved into sort of more looking at it from the, a business's perspective? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. We originally, uh, our first sort of concept was a digital wallet identity, digital identity wallet, yep. allowing you to upload your documents and then you could go ahead and sign up to a bank account, credit card, uh, buy an airline ticket, all without having to continually provide your information again and again and again Yeah, because um, that's frustrating mm. in itself. Um, but we realized we could help a lot more individuals and businesses by going B2B. Yeah. Yep, so and that's that's where the platform was born. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, we've financial advisors, and we're we're part of the requirements for you know anti money laundering and all that sort of thing. So we certainly are aware of all of this. But there's so many businesses that ask for ID outside of all of that. So many now. So all of those businesses are they? You know, is is there a copy they're keeping? What are they doing? Like, there's this is layer upon layer upon layer of places that ID can sit. So it is something that, you know, is – is, and we are all taking it seriously, but I think it's easy, easy for us to underrate how deep the job is, like how far it, it extends. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I signed up to a new bank account recently and I got asked for my driver's license over email. Right. <laughs> I, that doesn't sound necessarily bad, but, but that's one of the worst things you can do. If either email account got breached, you know, you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, you just don't want to be sending that sensitive stuff over email. And yeah. as a financial institution, you shouldn't be asking for that by email. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's then talk about Persona and it's, as it stands now. For a business, small business, large business, with whichever it is, what's this sort of primary problem it's trying to solve for them? Where is it coming at, at from the business's perspective? Yeah, that's right. So what we quickly realized, and we've sat down with accountants, wealth planners, law firms, a, a fair few small businesses, just trying to understand their true pain points, especially mm -hmm. we live in this sort of changing compliance landscape. You've got just recently the amendment to the Anti-Money Laundering and Counterterrorism Financing Act, which now requires designated services to be enrolled with Austrac. Yep. form identity verification, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was recently changed. We've got um, the Tranche 2 AML reforms incoming very soon, yep. requiring anti-money laundering checks. Yep. Then we've also got Privacy Act reforms incoming, which is going to mandate how uh, data is protected. And with the new Privacy Act, uh, sort of no company is safe from a fine. It used to be, you used to have to earn like $2 million a year. Now it's just any company. Yeah. So we've got an increasingly changing landscape and it is constantly changing. And we quickly realized that small businesses especially don't necessarily have the resources to implement sort of complex integrations, technology, and comply with all of these ever-changing regulations. Yeah. So- Persona is essentially a platform that simplifies identity verification because that in itself is complex. <laughs> also allows businesses, small businesses, to comply with KYC, AML, CTF, um, and overall save time, makes them more efficient in the processes. Yeah, cool. Okay. So in terms of then, um, you know, one of the businesses you guys have, have sort of uh, worked with, then I'm curious about 
I'm all a bit about the process. Like in real life, how does it work for the individuals in the business and their clients? So um, they're, yeah. they're a client of yours. Then what happens when they need to identify somebody? How does that come about? Yeah, definitely. So essentially, let's say you are a an accountant. Mm-hmm. That's probably a great example. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you want to onboard a new customer. You can type in their first name, last name, email, phone number, click send. We'll send them a link. They can upload their documents and you get the results back in an easy to view, easy to understand platform. So you can essentially verify an identity in two clicks and it takes about two minutes. Okay. And it with the, you know, we were just talking about email. I'm a, so that link expires or is there something like that that means that um, where they're protecting them, you know, this email challenge we all have as well? Yeah, that's right. So the links do expire after 72 hours. Yep, okay. Um, you can resend the link if a client just happens to be busy for three days. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, the links do expire. That's right. And I think it is something that probably we, we over time, will all need to adjust for is almost um, better scripting and prep for clients. Okay, we're, we're going to send this through. If you can just get it done straight away, there's other things we're going to have to provide us or other information. It's all good. But if we can just get this done so we can get over this hurdle and sort of um, prioritize and, and, and speed up those things so that there's less of this gap that can actually, you know, allow something to go wrong or or somebody to get access. So I think it's, you know, we probably do need to adjust to that um, and sort of create that momentum so that they act. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a great way to mitigate any internal risk as well. Yeah. So then, so the person has got their link, they, um, they click on the link. And so what is that experience for them? What are they doing when they're sort of at that link? Yeah. So our customers get to choose. Obviously, our customers being small businesses, Mm -hmm. they get to choose which documents they'd like to collect, whether that be even a bank statement, passport, driver's license, um, any any sort of document like that. Yep. Maybe they also want to conduct a uh, sort of selfie check. Yes. uh, Like your phone does every time you unlock it. Yep. And that's exactly what the client would go through. So obviously, we started with sort of consumers in mind individuals in mind because you know I'm I'm one of them yeah so are you <laughs> um so we made the process very intuitive they simply just snap a photo of their driver's license scan their face yep. and they're done it takes them 30 seconds and the sort of business gets the results in a minute two minutes beautiful so I'll get to the results in a second so um we were chatting about AI, everything's crazy. You know, there's all sorts of things out there. And one of the, I mean, there's so many crazy things, but one of them, of course, is, you know, avatars and and all this sort of stuff. So is some of the smarts going on when you're doing that scan is identifying, is this really a human being? Like, is this really a person we're scanning? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it looks very simple on the front end. Yeah. It looks, you know, very simple, but on the back end, there is a lot going on um, where what what we do slightly differently is when we're processing a document, before we even check the data on that document is legitimate, we're actually checking if the document has been graphically edited, if it's a forgery, fake ID, uh, even a fake bank statement, because we've had customers that have lost thousands of dollars um, underwriting credit um, because of falsified bank statements. Yes. Um, but yes, yeah, so in terms of deep fakes, you know, AI generated sort of photos that's going around, that's going around mm. now, and um, we're absolutely checking for that. Okay, beautiful. So the person's done the, and and this is interesting when you know more businesses are doing things, you know, virtually or or over the phone, that sort of stuff, as opposed to into the, you know, coming into the office. Um, so you know, it's great to have something that does that sort of the selfie against the ID, uh, and also the quality of ID is is that you know is it real? Uh, is it, is it not a fake? So then that gets done. Like you say, the clients, they're done at their end pretty quickly. Yay. Um, then from the business's perspective, what's the output for them? That's right. So they get access to all of the data on that document should they need it. Okay. Um, what we're also doing is checking various sort of online databases, new sites to see if that client is um, a known fraudster, are they, have they been in the news for any bad reasons? So all of that adverse and negative media. Yeah, okay. And we're checking sort of PEP sanctions, watch lists, um, various uh, data, like AML databases essentially. Yeah. Um, and providing you with all that information 
also with a risk score as well. So we calculate sort of how risky we deem the individual to be and, and provide you with all of that information and the documents too. Okay. And so uh, one of the things I'm, I'm interested in actually, because, you know, <laughs> you can't, turn a page of the paper over without seeing, you know, a hack or some other thing that's gone on uh, or, you know, internet provider going down, whatever it might be. Um, But Timely. Right, yeah. um, But the, you know, the copies of ID, you know, being held, that sort of thing, is really where we're going. So with something like Persona is that you guys have done this check. We might have a report that it's been done, but we don't actually have the ID on file. That's right. So the whole notion is that you don't need to store that document locally yep. on your desktop or down in your downloads folder yep. or on an email server. Yeah, perfect. Um, because that is something that I think, you know, it's due to the financial institutions, often they require certain things. And, and I get that. Um, and even with AML, I get why it's there, but sometimes you're balancing one risk, uh, anti-money laundering against identity theft, right? And so it's like, well, hold on how often does one thing happen versus the other, you know, and and which thing is the bigger risk? So everything we can do that ticks the box that needs to be ticked and we're getting it right without actually almost creating extra risks, um, you know, down the track, I think is really important. Or using up extra time. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Like another form. We don't have enough in the day. (laughs) We've all got better things to do, right? (laughs) For sure. So I'm curious, you may not have an answer, and I haven't prepped you for this question, so I apologize in advance. Um, Have you had a broad demographic use the tool? So do you find everybody, you know, um, what I'm saying here is for old farts like me and older, do you find most people manage to, you know, do the scan and do the the selfie pretty easily? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I think our um, oldest individual verified has been 96, Okay, I believe. Okay. It, it's it's so intuitive that you actually can't go wrong. Yeah. Even if you upload a blurry photo before you hit submit, um, it will let you know, hey, this is blurry, like you should retake it. Yeah. Okay. And look, really, if somebody's, I mean, my benchmark to me is if somebody's got a smartphone, they can probably do this, you know, like a smartphone and have ever used the photo app. <laughs> So, you know, and, and yes, there'll be people that fall outside that category. Um, in fact, my mother-in-law only has a flip phone. Well, that's a bit different. <laughs> she might need assistance. But aside from that, um, you know, I think most people uh, can probably cope with these things more than we expect, I would imagine. Uh, let's talk then about integration. I mean, so, oh, you know, off the top of my head, perhaps, you know, there's a practice out there that has a client portal, which is part of their effort to have all communications be in something that's, you know, potentially more secure and it's sort of got the, you know, big high gates <laughs> all around it. Um, do you, you know, is there the opportunity to integrate or some somehow sort of work within those sort of tools with Persona? 100%. Yeah. So we have an API mm-hmm. that anybody can use. So we actually serve enterprises as well as small businesses, okay. but really want to sort of advocate for the SMEs because nobody else is. Yes. Um, and I, you know, see that as wrong. You shouldn't really just be going after enterprises. And I generally, it genuinely comes from a place where I want to help small businesses. Yep. Um, so yeah, we absolutely do have an API that can be integrated anywhere. Um, but what we are also doing is working on direct integrations with uh, things like accountant CRMs um, and sort of other uh, integrations, as well as sort of a no code drag and drop sort of if this, then that. Right, right, perfect. So almost almost trigger-based, something that just lets things, yeah, okay, perfect. Exactly, like a Zapier sort yeah, of, um, okay. sort of, yeah, that's exactly right. Perfect. Um, because it is, you know, this is sort of, I mean, not necessarily for, depending on how much sort of new style business that advisors are doing, they, you know, they may not do as much of this, but if they are, then it could be something you're doing a lot of and it'd be great to sort of just have it folded in. Um, to other processes so that it sort of we, just happens. We love automation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't we? And particularly for things like this that really are structured, repetitive, you know. Um, That's right. You know, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's powerful to think about the potential, like the database checks you guys, like there's a whole lot of reach there um, that, you know, little old small business would struggle to get access to. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Well, that's exactly right. So obviously you've got the AI that's checking for digital manipulation is what we call it. Mm -hmm. So graphical editing, forgery, all that sort of stuff. Um, But yeah, so we have access to 
and vehicle registries, death registries, electoral roll, government commercial databases, telcos. Um, there's about 50 to 100 more yeah. um, that all get checked, get put into this decision engine, which then gives you a result. Yeah. Awesome. So then, you know, in terms of the business using the tech, I'm curious, um, you know, is there – is there any any ways in which they've utilized it or like has there been any surprises for you? We're like, oh, that's really cool. Like, is there anything come out? I know it's still relatively early days for the business, but is there anything that's sort of come out of the user's hands, which is often what happens when you've got new tech? We've got some really interesting customers on the platform. Um, and I love, we, we always built the platform to sort of be the underlying tech for other technology. Right. And um, it's also global from day dot. So we've got customers around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we've got some really interesting customers that I wouldn't ha- have originally thought would be using the platform, yeah, okay. if that makes sense. Yes. So, um, yeah, cool. You know, and, and I guess, you know, where we're all going with this sort of stuff is probably places that maybe in a uh, physical world wouldn't necessarily do this stuff. If they are operating virtually, this is the sort of thing that can protect the business as well as the individual, you know. So it's a layer that can say, yes, this is really a human being doing this. Um, yeah, And And absolutely. when you think about it, I mean, businesses get scammed by people you – know, purchasing things and then, you know, it getting delivered and there's not existent and the charge gets reversed. Like there's all sorts of things going on, you know, for for online like that. So I can see that it might start to apply in different industries um, where they're like, you know what, we want to see if that's a real human being. Yeah, we're talking um, industries like pet care and dog walking. Interesting. Um, decentralized identity. So we power a decentralized identity um, sort of provider. Yep. Um, we power other identity providers that use our technology. Um, obviously, accountants, wealth planners. Yep. Um, there's a whole range of industries that we service um, and we've specifically built the platform to accommodate for a, a wide range of small businesses in different industries. So, uh, and I guess I've got to ask the question because it seems like a blindingly obvious one, but the, you know, the scans happened, those, that details within persona, you know, how confident can the individual be that their information is within persona and what happens to it? Yeah, absolutely. So data protection is obviously a huge, data protection is is very the important yeah. to us. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're also regulated in the way that we store data as yeah. well. Dealing with PII or personally identifiable information is is you know it's 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 serious stuff. Mm. Um, what what we do um, slightly differently is you know everything's encrypted. Yes, that's that's sort of standard nowadays. Um, but no one piece of information or document is stored on a single server. So if you think, if we take a, a driver's license, for example, mm-hmm. um, imagine so a client's uploaded it, what we do, we verify it, um, business gets their result. Then when it gets stored, it's chopped up into, think of it as being chopped up into 10 different pieces, and yep. then each piece is stored on a different server. Yeah, okay. So if we were to be breached, um, then no one would really have access to a singular document or piece of information that ties back to an individual. Yeah, okay. So it's sort of like a, a virtual little shredder that then pushes those little pieces out to different locations. Yeah, yeah. And, when a, and when a business wants to sort of retrieve that information, it gets put back together and the platform is the only one that can put the document back together. Yeah, okay. And I guess, you know, is there a decision also though for, for business clients to say, well, we're, we're doing this check in the moment – um, and we might get a report or something that says that that's gone on. Do they then have to, the choice to say, Persona, we don't need you to store this? Yeah, you can move it to an archive, um, which will then sort of push for it to be deleted in 30 days, okay. for example. Yeah, okay. Um, so that could just be part of, you know, how you decide to process, depending on what you've decided, you what approach you want to apply um, to that's this. That's right. It, it, it really depends on the industry. The Privacy Act um, specifically states that you have to – keep data um, for seven years after the client has left yeah. um, your company or has stopped using your services, um, which is why the Optus breach was just so large Yes, <laughs> um, because they have to keep the data for seven years. So it depends on the industry, um, but there is that option. Yeah, okay. Perfect. So 
what's on the development path? So what what have you guys got coming, you know, in the shorter term? But I'm also curious about the sort of blue sky end too. So where, you know, what are the, ooh, I'd love to see it, you know, go this far um, for Persona. Absolutely. So um, there's a few exciting things mm-hmm. coming. I'll talk about one of them. I'll talk about my favourite. Yep. And digital identity is becoming massive. Yeah. It's, it's a hot topic at the moment. And small businesses generally are the last to receive brand new technologies that they can use. Mm. So if you're thinking it, thinking from it, if you're thinking of it from an accountant point of view, yep. this digital identity thing, yeah, it's great, but like what is it of use to me? Right. Well, what we're doing is going to be implementing digital identity verification directly into a uh, like an applicant's flow, for example, so that accountants, wealth funders, small businesses will be able to verify digital identity from the get-go. Right, right. Okay. So a customer will be able to choose, yeah, I want to upload my document or I want to verify digitally. Okay. Okay. So when, just to be clear, actually, just in case, um, you know, a listener isn't clear on what the difference is. So the what we were describing previously is the sort of, you know, upload, compare against photo. When you're talking about digital identity, what do you mean? Like what's I know I'm asking a hard question, but what do you mean by that? Yeah. No, of course. So the government has released a framework for digital identity and we Australians can now actually create their own digital identity. A little bit different to MyGov, similar, but different. Okay. So you can actually, if you search up digitalidentity.gov.au, you can actually go and create your own digital identity now. Yeah. Um, And we're going to be able to verify that. Okay. Okay. So that's sort of a... Uh, that's almost a certainty in that it's pro- it's going to happen at some point and that's going to be something we're all going to need to be able to handle. Uh, and so well, there's eight, 8 million Australians have already signed up for their digital ID. Yeah, okay. Um, and obviously there's 24, 25 mm-hmm. million um, and it's only a matter of time before the rest do. So Yeah, okay, awesome. And is there anything anything else that's sort of further down the track that's on the wish yeah, list? Yeah, but- there's definitely a few things. Um, the digital wallet aspect yep. will definitely come up again um, so we can sort of close our ecosystem, yep. so to speak. Yep. Um, so it's just the secure information between individuals and businesses, yep. um, which I think is really important. Mm. Um, and we've got a few other things happening as well that I probably can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, then- that's exciting though, and I think – you know, I would argue because you're, you might have started in the individual's perspective, but because you're looking at it and you're going to see so many industries and so many places where this is necessary, probably then the quality or the usability of the digital wallet will end up being better because it's, you know, you may not have thought of a whole lot of things that it'll need to do or it'll need to be able to provide or, you know, like I think it'll, it'll give it some rigor that perhaps it wouldn't have had before. Absolutely. And I love features. <laughs> <laughs> Me don't, too. don't tell the developers that, but I love features. <laughs> oh, I love it. Is there anything else we've missed? Anything that anybody no, needs to know? We've covered everything no, else? That, that, that's it. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Persona, then the website link is in the episode show notes along with Charlie's LinkedIn details. I'm sure he could point you in the right place of who you should speak to and you know what member of the team can sort of do a demo and run you through the tool. So you know, absolutely do that if you're interested. And Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm really, you know, interested in the way you've applied um, AI and the tech to sort of really help us not just comply, but I think, you know, do better for our businesses and our clients. So thank you so much for your time, Charlie. Thank you. And thank you for having me as well. All righty. Well, I'm betting that as listeners, you're probably not a customer of Persona just yet. This is relatively new, um, but I am curious on your thoughts. You know, what are the challenges? What are the what what excited you about about the tool? Um, and you know, please share your insights on the Ensemble Community platform. Um, as you know, I'd love to hear your take uh, and hear any you know anything that you think. Oh, it'd be great if it did this, or I'm wondering if it does that, or I'm concerned about this. Any of those thoughts are all positive as we go on this journey together. In terms of um, my thoughts, I think um, having chatted to Charlie before we actually hit record, one of the things that did stand out is a lot of these types of functions, you know, these sort of big, really it's a corporate end of town sort of functionality, you know, this sort of digital checking and, you know, it's this big clunky systems they're going to use, you know, banks, all sorts of things are going to need to do this stuff. And therefore, generally it requires 
those types of budgets, right? And so even if you were to engage a specialty business that does these things or makes these apps or develops them, you know, there might be a, a 50K or 100K setup fee and then there'd be customization fees. And then be like this, it'd be this ludicrously expensive process for a small business to have to try and go through. And, you know, so to me, the more of these types of tools that are being built so that small business can use them and do, you know, get access to wonderful and well done tools that otherwise, you know, we, we would only get if we had a bank's um, budget for tech, you know, that excites me, I've got to say. So I think, you know, it's exciting to think through what this means, um, you know, what it may mean down the track, how it can make our clients' lives and even their, their identities more protected uh, and hence our businesses, you know, more protected. So I think, you know, it's a worthwhile to keep on seeing these, you know, what's out there, what's possible so that we can all be aware of things just as they tip over into that, wow, that's really going to get the job done um, so that we can all, um, you know, take advantage of that for our clients. Now, it's that time for the episode. Uh, we all know the one skill we need to become a truly, really, really bionic advisors is avid curiosity. And to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner website that I'd love you to check out is called Wonder Plan. Now, Wonder Plan, uh, the website is wonderplan.ai. Uh, and Wonder Plan is basically your personal travel curator, right? And it sort of shapes itineraries uniquely for you based around the things you're interested in and how much you want to spend. Now, as somebody who has spent an inordinate amount of time researching holidays, uh, my hubby and I love travel. We love doing all sorts of exciting things when we travel. Then the idea of having a tool that potentially could get us on the right track, at least to begin with, is exciting. So I entered in a trip that we're considering in the future, which is Buenos Aires. It asked me, what's your destination? You put in the time of year that you're thinking of traveling, how long, what your budget is. And this is just categories. Like it's all very just click. Um, is it yourself, a couple, family, friends, that sort of thing, what activities you're interested in. And then you hit submit. And so what the tool then does is pulls together the draft of an itinerary for you. And what's interesting about it is it does it with a map next to it. So you can sort of really see what it's suggesting. Um, it also gives you the high level insights in terms of the place and, and, you know, what you might be interested in. So, you know, it says, oh, hey, Buenos Aires is the Paris of South America, right? And so it gives you a summary. It gives you insight into the currency, the sort of temperatures you're going to be dealing with at that time, what electricity you know, think plugs and things you might need. Um, and then it maps out a sample itinerary. And what's interesting is then it prompts you at each uh, location that it might have suggested as a stop to then research possible accommodation and it pushes you through to bookings.com to then help you start that research. So it's sort of, even if you don't do any of the purchasing or the setup via this tool, it's just sort of trying to get you started on that um, journey and, and you know, kickstart your efforts. So here we go. It's got, oh, at day one, you're going to be, um, you, we might want to do the Plaza de Mayo, um, which is all part of the political history there. Um, and then, you know, or you could have a lot of lovely, uh, how's this, enjoy a romantic lunch by the waterfront in the trendy no neighborhood of Puerto Madero. And I'm going to have messed up that. So I apologize to anybody who um, is native to this area. Um, but it's got, you know, plans for each day, all sorts of interesting, really interesting actually things you could go and do. Um, and it's planned it out for you in a day by day basis, um, which is very, very cool. It estimates possible costs, you know, even for uh, food um, and other activities. And it's, yeah, it's, it's suggesting all sorts of things you could then go off and do um, and, you know, have sort of day trips for. So, I just think it's a fun thing to play with. And look, I think we should all have um, future travels or future experiences that we're enjoying. So I'd love to know if you have a play, how you find it, um, and whether maybe you've got some uh, holidays that it therefore inspires you to take. Uh, so please let me know whether you have a bit of a play with Wonder Plan. Well, that's all we've got for this week, folks. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice, tech fix, or to magically sent to you each Friday. 
And if, like me, you're ready to achieve zen in the world of advice advice tech, then be sure to check out my new keynote for 2024, which is the zen of advice tech, finding balance in the digital age. You know, and so this is where we're going to be overwhelmed. There's lots of tech solutions. How many should I have? I don't have a tech stack. I've got a tech pile. Um, Then this is all about showing you how to streamline your tech stack, enhance your client relationships, all while applying a really mindful approach to tech mastery. So, hey, you know, let's go on a bit of an adventure to a more focused, a more efficient and rewarding operational environment together. So if you're curious, hey, I'd love to have a chat. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That'll be LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. And we can definitely have a bit of a natter. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 